love lives here. Okay, let's get this party started. So, there's a monastery in Tibet and is perched on a high mountain. And you have to hike for most of the day to get to the base of the cliff, rising into the mist-shrouded peaks. From there, the way to the entrance, entrance of, the, of the monastery is being suspended in a basket and pulled top, you know, like this, this long thing, and it, you pull it, you pull it, pull it to get to the entrance. So obviously the ride up is steep because it's a steep cliff and you're in a basket. You're holding a basket. And so, you know, it might be, what, terrifying. So one traveler got exceedingly nervous about halfway up as he noticed that the rope suspending the basket was old and frayed. So he felt completely vulnerable. And with a trembling voice, he asked the monk who was riding with him how often they changed the ropes. And so the monk looked at the ropes and thought for a moment and answered, whenever it breaks. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about vulnerability. So my talk title today is Truth or Dare. And I don't know if maybe you played this game before, but the game has been around for hundreds of years. And um, you know, there's a variant of there's a question and a command. And then you can attest it but it's been played for decades. And so the game presents the players with a choice between revealing the truth about themselves or completing the daring challenge proposed by the other players. Does anybody know this game? Okay, sometimes in the game, the participants choose to reveal the truth or take the dare. I'm not gonna ask you guys how many took the truth or did the dare. But imagine you're in high school and you're a student. And the game that you're playing at the cafeteria table, because you're just, you know, wasting, after you've eaten, there's some time left. And imagine that game is truth or dare. And you are playing it with your peers. And so what do you want? You want to be liked by your peers. You want to be safe, though. You want to be, you want to know that you're in a safe place, right? That you can be vulnerable. You want to be accepted. You want to be liked. And it can be difficult to show others your real self, you know, because we put on these masks, and there are several of them that we may put on. But in all in all, we want to be liked and accepted and not be judged, right? So there's a pyramid called Maslow, and Maslow proposed that motivation is a result of a person's attempt to fulfill the five basic needs. And some of those needs are food, clothing, safety, safety is one of them, security, love, and belonging, friendship, social acceptance, self-esteem, and self-actualization. So all wrapped up into our lives, we basically just want to be loved and accepted. And so sometimes it can be very difficult to be fully transparent and vulnerable it can be difficult for us to live out loud and live our authentic selves. And so life is complicated. And we hear in our teaching, live out loud, be your authentic selves. You know, you are one with God and, you know, that's good enough. And it is good enough, but it could be challenging, right? Right? So we know that life is complicated, but it can be Magnificent. It is pretty magnificent. When you got up this morning, you took a deep breath. And you didn't have to worry about, oh, how do I do this again? How do I do that? You're, you're, you're just kind of, your body's kind of on automatic. This God thing is living and breathing and living and breathing you, right? So it can be magnificent. So Parker Palmer has a book called The Hidden, a Hidden Wholeness. And he says, because our stories make us vulnerable to being fixed, exploited, dismissed, or ignored, we've learned to tell them guardedly or not at all. Would you agree with that statement? Sometimes we can be really guarded. 
So it says, he says, goes on to say, neighbors, coworkers, and even family members can live side by side for years without learning much about each other. Have you grown up in the house with someone and you're like, who's that person? Do we have the same parents? Who are they? So as a result, we lose something of great value. For the more we know about another story, the harder it is to hate someone or to harm someone. So the more I know about you and where you came from and what your life was, and the more I can share that about myself, we can begin to understand each other. So life is full of uncomfortabilities, though. And let's call that divine discomfort. So our lives are always shifting. It's always changing. And so one of the things that I wanted to point out, you know, is when we're born, you know, birth itself is a shift. We don't remember it, but I can imagine that we were in this warm place, right? Surrounded by this lovely warm fluid, nurturing us, keeping us from the cold. We didn't even know what cold was, probably. And then we're born, and we're in this terrifying new environment. And it's our first experience of the world. And so we begin to learn how to get along in the world. We cry because we need something or want something. You know, and then we grow up and we get in school and we have to, you know, get along and play the game and, and do all those things that they ask us to do. You know, um, so, so we've learned to kind of be uncomfortable. We've learned to kind of fit in. You know, so we've learned to fit in. So like I said, in our teaching, we're always, you know, we talk about being vulnerable. So what is vulnerability? So when you hear the word, you might think that, you know, if I'm vulnerable, I might be viewed as a weak person. And nobody wants to be deemed a weak person. And we may feel exposed and we may, be a, we may be feeling like we are exposing ourselves in a way that we can be hurt. But Brene Brown says, um, vulnerability is a state of emotional exposure that comes with a certain degree of uncertainty. It involves a person's willingness to accept the emotional risk that comes from being open and willing to love and be loved. So to be vulnerable is to explore the depths of ourselves, even when we are unsure of what we may uncover. It is stepping out often in the face of uncertainty and fear for the purpose of fostering a fuller expression of ourselves and of, of others. So what is it? What is this vulnerability thing? It's an honest expression of, the, uh, of our authentic self. It is a courage, it, is, it takes courage, and it's a courageous act to be willing to open our minds and our hearts to each other, to be seen for who we are, to be seen as our authentic selves. The truth and our truth can become an elusive thing when we keep hiding who we are. And so we may be looking for it, we may be in search of it, well, who am I really? I've not shown myself for many a year, you know. People don't really know who I am. So it can be scary. So in Matthew 10, chapter 16, verse, it says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as harmless as doves and as wise as a serpent. And then Ernest Holmes says, we resist being what we really are we need to accept the fuller expression of the mind that is within us, for it is creative. It is a creative flow through which we rest. Our entire future depends on it. So I have this thing I'm going to show, but not right now. It's going to show it in a few minutes. So one of our core concepts is the universe is whole. And the allness of the universe is in each of us, and we are one with it. So spirit is transcendent, is perfect, and it can choose 
So us being in it as it, we can choose. We can choose to be free or we can choose to be in bondage, right? So as the Spirit expresses, we, choose, we can choose to live in bondage, freedom, abundance, or lack, joy or misery, harmoniously or not. So it's a choice. Reverend Frank Matoza used to say, we're always at choice. So when you and I, when we put down the need to be comfortable, it allows space for our transformation. So in 2020, I was working at my career in um, radiation oncology. And COVID happened. And um, they decided that, because I was the administrator and the marketing manager. So they decided that um, they would handle any marketing and any management of the, the facilities at, on the corporate, corporate level. So one Friday, I walked into work, just as happy as I am, and I got a call about 10 o'clock from my manager saying, oh, Sanja, um, the company has decided that we're going to take all the management up to corporate, and so I need you to pack up your desk. Uh, what? I need you to pack up your desk. And so I did, but I was like, well, what happened? You know, I, I, I didn't see it coming. So sometimes you don't see it coming. But n needless to say, I did what I needed to do, and I left the thing. I left the job. When I got home, I was terrified because that's half of our income, gone, just like that. But I decided that I needed a break because I was angry. I was really angry because I, I felt like I was blindsided. So I talked to Daryl, and, and I asked him, you know, there's a retreat center in San Diego that I want to go to. And it's a seven-day, you can do up to three weeks if you want to, but I decided to go for the first seven days and check it out. So we agreed that I would do that, and he drove me up there, so I was up there for seven days. And so what I was searching for, I was searching for just what's next for me. I, I was feeling vulnerable. I was feeling like, where do I fit? You know, and so... I want to show you something that happened, but I, I'll tell you about it first. Jason, you almost ready? But not just yet. So, <laughs> so I have this big hair, and I, I like big hair. So I, I, when I was at the retreat, there was these caterpillars everywhere, just everywhere. And they were just crawling, crawling, crawling. And one day I went back to my room, and one was making its way up the side of my, you know, by the door. And then I looked up again, and it was over here. You know, they move remarkably fast when you're not, when you least expect it, they're where they intended to go. So then I looked, and he was right over my head. And I was saying to myself, if you fall in my hair, that's it. It's a wrap. But I want to show you what actually happened. So you look at your screens. I, I filmed it because it was fascinating. And I want you to share it with you. I watched this whole process. Now look what happens right now. You see that? You see that? <laughs> and then he's slowing down he's slowing down he's slowing down and then he eventually stops that's good Jason thank you so did you see that thing that fell down his head his head is all about consciousness he no longer needs the consciousness of the caterpillar because he's going through transformation I was oh my god I can feel the, the goose flesh. He no longer need he no longer needed the that consciousness of the caterpillar. He's in the metamorphosis, right? 
And when he comes out of the cocoon, he will be renewed, reborn with the consciousness to spread his wings and fly. Correct? So that's what I learned. That no matter what happens in your life, there's more to come. That you just move your consciousness into a different direction. I learned transformation. I relaxed. It was a beautiful thing. That's why I recorded it. So recognizing there is a greater power compelling us to move forward. Compelling us to let go of the old ways and bring about and embrace something new. And so in 1 Corinthians 13, chapter 11, 13, first it says, When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I did away with childish things. For now, in this time, we see in the mirror dimly a blurred reflection, an enigma. But then when the time of perfection comes, we will see reality face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have fully been known by spirit. So in all of that, there's a greater, more magnificent part of us that's waiting. We're waiting for the world to, to see it. The world is waiting for you to share who you are that God consciousness, that awareness. And I don't know about you, but I want to see it in this day. I want to recognize it. As I begin to recognize it more fully in myself, it gives rise to people recognize. It's like when that commercial when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. So a trickle-down effect, just like a domino effect. So we are recognizing that being uncomfortable is the least of our concerns. I'm sure that Caterpillar was uncomfortable with what was happening, but that was the, rele the least of his con its concern because love was at work. The law was at work. So I'm gonna stop here and we can go to our table conversations. Okay, we're back. All right, we're back. So to wrap this up, I'm just going to say a few more words and then we'll move forward. So thank you all for participating in this at, the t at your tables. So in conclusion, we know that change is uncomfortable. Uh, but the science of mind says the discomfort of change highlights the importance of embracing conscious awareness positive, not wishful thinking that is based in principle and aligning our beliefs with the creative power of the universe. And by embracing change with openness and releasing resistance, we can experience personal growth and create more of a fulfilling life. And so you, me, we, when we begin to recognize our power and potential for positive transformation, when we embrace change and release limiting beliefs, cultivate awareness, engage in affirmative practices, seek support, and take inspired action, there's nothing that we can't achieve. So Aaron Van Buren is quoted to say, don't you dare trim back those wings because they're taking up all the space in the room. Let them break the roof. So go out and be brave. Live out loud, be vulnerable, don't hide behind the dare, and embrace your truth. Unify with that which has never been divided against you. And next time when playing the game, take the dare to allow yourself to be fully seen as the wonderful, beautiful expressions of God that you are, unapologetically, and know that you are whole, you are perfect, and you are complete. I dare you.
Thank you. So your homework is to contemplate the idea that change is an opportunity for self-discovery and spiritual expansion. So I need you to agree to write an affirmation, affirmative prayer for yourself, affirming and realigning your thoughts with your truth and setting the creative process in motion. So I want you to do that for yourself. All these ways that you can just live out loud. And if you know the steps of treatment, if you're new here, see a practitioner. We can walk you through those. And we have two visitors today, so we want to thank you for joining us at the morning table. And then our affirmation today, let's say it together. I know I am one with spirit. Let's say it again. I know I am one with spirit. Now I ask the practitioners and core uh, leadership council to stand as I pray us out. And just taking in a deep breath and just releasing all the things that, ooh, all that energy, that good energy that we've shared today. So knowing that there's only one life, that life is God's life, that life is my life now, that life is your life now, and we are expressing it right here, right now. God is through everything. This universal presence in mind is in and through all creation, you and me and everything else. And as I remember it, and as we remember it together in consciousness, it transforms us, it changes our lives. So I bless you on this Sunday morning, bless you with all the beauty, all the love, all the joy, all the peace, prosperity, health, and wholeness that you can imagine in your life. Thank you for coming today to the morning table. Love lives here at CSL where together we rise. Now let's